thanks for having me. Uh, it's really cool to be here. Um, can you guys in the back here mostly? Can I? Am I projecting enough? OK, otherwise, just let me know. I'll, I, I could trail off at some point if I start brooding too much. Um, so let me see. So uh, yeah, I'm David, uh, one of the founders of this wonderful company. We were three. Um, and uh, I'll get into the sort of company in a second. But, but you know, what I've been thinking of talking about is sort of uh, the sort of stages of the company as we grew and some sort of lessons learned and pain points and weird uh, experiences and realizations. Um, I think we got an hour. Um, I'll try to reserve time for a Q and A, but also if we can just insert it uh, in the right uh, moments, that would be fantastic. So I'll totally accept, you know, hands up in there anytime. Um, I think that's it, right? <laughs> okay, let's do it. Uh, so, so what is Unity? You know, it's it's a it's 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 a, it's a company that uh, that produces an engine called the Unity Game Engine, and the Game Engine is a platform for developing um, games and game-like content. We focus very much and disproportionately much on games. I'll talk a little bit about that later, but you can actually produce other sort of interactive 3D experiences with it. We've seen almost any kind of human endeavor, um, you know, using Unity somehow uh, to simulate uh, the Mars rover, research scientists uh, visualizing some of their data, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, but we're first and foremost a game technology platform, and that's where our business is, and that's where our hearts are. Um, something like 1.1 million developers sit down and use Unity every month which is very cool because like the three times the population of Iceland, which is where I'm born. And, uh, <laughs> and that, you know, that's like 4.5 lifetime, which is actually a less important number because it's a free download. So you know how that works. Um, but a lot of people come back every month, something like a quarter of every, anyone who's ever used Unity were, used it in the last 30 days. You can only do that in two, uh, two, two ways. One is if you have a very high growth rate where like all the users are new users or you have a very sticky user base, and that's our case, which is, of course, wonderful and valuable. Um, something like you know, 45, in ca some cases, 50% of all uh, mobile game developers are using Unity. Um, in some areas, like console games, it's slower. In other areas, like VR, it's way higher. Uh, we've been told by Palmer Lucky, the founder of Oculus, uh, that something like 90, 95% of all the stuff they see for VR is ba built in Unity. Um, of course, that's a, that's a sort of a spread. The games industry is a very complex industry. It has a lot of nooks and crannies, and, uh, crannies and, and you know I won't get into all the details of that. But what's neat is that you know, if you look at the entire um, world of developers, software developers of any kind, something like 5% of them use Unity in a month. Not professionally necessarily. Many of them are hobbyists, trying it out, using it in their spare time. Uh, Phil Libin, the, uh, the founder of, uh, and former CEO of Evernote that I use for my own notes, uh, snuck, uh, sn snuck up to me at a party once and said, you know, that he used to be a developer, now he's a CEO and a business guy, but all his sort of, um, you know, his um, fantasies about being a software developer, he lives out through Unity, which is really cool. Um, now, these people build a bunch of games that have a total of around 15 billion app installs in a year, uh, which, you know, sort of, if you map that out to how much time they spend, and, you know, you can actually get to, like, human minutes, like, you know, minutes spent per human per year which I don't know what it is, but it's definitely more than one, which is kind of nuts. Um, so th that's one way of looking at it. Another is as a company, we grew very fast. We had sort of eight years of 100% Kager, uh, which is very cool. It's uh, admittedly lower now, but not that much lower. Uh, we have, we're 750 people today across 22 offices, very dispersed. The biggest office is 150 people. So it tells you sort of a long, fat tail of offices. Um, we added 150 staff, this Q3. And we've raised $20 million, which you know, for in inexperienced audiences would sound like, oh, that's a lot. Of course, you know that's a very small amount. Uh, so we're very, very proud of that, that we actually built the company mostly profitably. Um, just to show you a very short glimpse of what Unity is as a technology, here's a video of some of the new features in a recent um, version, just sort of to get a sense of what this is. Let's see if the audio works. May or may not. It's OK.
So this is the audio system, right? The problem is the guy who made this video is like an audio guy, so it's like five minutes of this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so let's, let's skip from here on out. Um, but the cool thing is like this piece of technology is used by some of the biggest game companies in the world, uh, but it's also free and available online. So you got like, we, we got like eight, nine-year-old kids playing with it. And what's really fantastic is they get exactly the same piece of software that Electronic Arts and Blizzard and these guys get, which is something we're very proud of. Um, what they make is a whole bunch of games. Um, very short, uh, I won't show the whole thing. What's, what's really impressive and, and what I'm really proud of about this reel is that this shows like highlights of some modern games that have been built with Unity. Um, the really important thing is actually the variety, how different they look. Uh, it's a very flexible platform that lets people really express their kind of ideas and their vision. Um, so you get a very, a lot of very different, a different type, of, type of people using it. In big groups like this, probably built by 30, 40 people. Um, some of the other games built by one or two people. Very cool. This is, I think, four guys. Took them five years to build. Um, And they then target all these platforms. So basically, we've taken this piece of software and, and made it work on every single platform there is um, in existence, which is mostly this. Um, sort of started somewhere up there and have been making our way down. Um, it's a lot of work. And making one piece of software, even just compile on, on, on platforms like this, is it's a massive uh, project. But you know that's something we, we've, we forced ourselves to figure out. Anyway, um, I want to back down to the sort of early stages and, and talk about a few of the stages of the company. right? So so uh, first off, we intended to, uh, here we go. Okay. So first off, we intended to start a game company. So we're three programmers, clever guys, no experience. Um, so we sat down in a basement and we coded um, our own tools. This is, of course, how many companies get started. Um, and then we realized that we sucked at making games, um, but that we sort of had some strange insight into tool making. I don't know exactly why. But there was something, we just had an intuition for how to make things easy. Um, so we built a tool that was um, actually quite terrible from a performance perspective and a feature perspective. But it was somehow easy enough to use that a few people could uh, figure out how to use it. Um, and and, 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 and we, we had no, I didn't do anything. Um, we, we, had, we, had no, we, had no, um, we had no funding. Uh, we tried to talk to some major capitalists. And they sort of looked at us the way I would have looked at myself. Uh, which is like, who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we couldn't even explain what the market was. We couldn't even explain which market we were even in. And, uh, and, and if anyone had actually done the math, and I, I don't think anyone did, and we certainly didn't, they would have found that our target audience was a few hundred people. Um, because the idea of an easy to use game development platform back in 2003 and four was just like a fundamentally bad idea. Uh, there was no market. Nobody actually needed that. Everyone was focused on big games and big teams. All the money was there. Um, so you know, of course, this is the first massive stroke of luck. Because, because nobody was trying to do it, there was a bit of air for us to sort of stumble around and figure it out and, and you know, build a product that eventually was. So we started building the product in 2001 and 2. Uh, and by 2008, uh, Apple opens the, Apple, the App Store. And we were the first pl uh, product to support development of, of games for the uh, iPhone. And, uh, and suddenly, that was a thing. And it happened very quickly. And we sort of managed to slingshot this kind of functioning company with, I think at the time, maybe um, I think 18 people. Um, like a real little independent uh, software vendor. ISV is the sort of old name of this kind of company. A company with not too much ambition and, and really no reason to get big. Um, uh, because companies like that are you know, actually kind of fragile little things. And they rarely grow big. But, but we managed to sort of slingshot ourselves into that platform shift when everyone was, not everyone at the same time, but a lot of people started moving from making big games for console into making, um, making uh, well, mobile games. Um, and and, and you know, only then was, became, did Unity go from being a bad idea to a good idea. And of course, due to very little effort of ours, you know, it was really, really like that, that level of luck. Um, and and you know, the, the sort of 
things we did right, frankly, were not taking venture capital, not because venture capital is a bad thing, just because you know, for such a weak team as us and ex an experienced team, um, it would have kind of tipped up. I, I think it would have toppled us over, and uh, we probably would have spent the money in the wrong way. The market wasn't ready, so for you know, uh, uh, for us to survive, we really just had to kind of stay in the, in the basement for for uh, many years, which, which we did. Uh, again, not our own choice, frankly, but that's sort of how it went. Um, one thing that's uh, you know is now sort of acknowledged is important for those stages is to do it everything yourself. Go out and sell yourself. Go out and support customers yourselves, and that's much easier if you don't have cash. Otherwise, you might go and hire some fancy people that become this insulation between you and the the real thing. Um, so we were lucky, not so smart. Um, we, 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 we did one thing right, though, which was very insightful of us. We started um, kind of defining a very big vision back when we were deciding to go from a game company to a software company. And the big vision was this vague, very kind of, um, um, how to say, like um, amorphous thing, which is we will democratize game development. We'll make everyone able to make games, we'll make people able to make better games, we'll invite more people into the industry, and we'll somehow help them go to all the platforms they want to go to. So this kind of flexibility and freedom. Um, and, 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 and looking back, you know, the, the, maybe the, well, one of the handful of best decisions we ever made was to come up with such a vague, unclear goal. And I remember I was writing the first business plan, which I found later, and it's like, um, to sort of quote Oscar Wilde, it's like a, it's like a love letter written by a teenager. Um, it's like full of vague ideas and, and typos. <laughs> it's misquoting of him, of course. Um, and it's, 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 um, that was really the tool that we used then to hire our first people. Like, you know, hiring really, really smart people is, is so much easier if you have kind of a beautiful idea to sell them on. And, and we had um, in this document of ours. Um, we also had sort of vague ideas like, we want to kill Flash. You remember Flash? That was like an interactive thing. Um, we didn't kill it, but you know, kind of uh, Steve Jobs and uh, and uh, Adobe management sort of colluded on that together <laughs> much later. Mm. But uh, so so we started out on that that path. We managed to grow the company, get to this level where um, iPhone be came into existence, and we were slingshot into that uh, into that world. And uh, and so we had to enter our sort of second stage, where we went from being a software company, independent software company, to being kind of a business to developer ecosystem community company. So selling our software to people that define themselves as a community and, 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 uh, and working with them as a community, uh, supporting them as a community, and building services for them as a community. Um, and, and, and the first um, and best thing we ever did in that area was the asset store. So if you think about you know, something like, like, like Unity, it's, it's, a, it's like a blank canvas. It's an empty stage. And if you're making a game, you're, you're going to populate it with your own characters, with your own props, with your own special effects, with the explosions and the <laughs> clouds and all the other stuff you saw in the games before. Um, that's really hard. And, 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 and there's something that very few teams can actually do uh, in quality. The big companies can do it. They just throw money at it. If they have scale, they outsource it to, I think it's Vietnam these days or the Philippines um, and, and other cheap areas. If you're a small team, you don't have the strength for that. So, so we created a marketplace for these people to trade amongst each other. We thought we could make money from this. Honestly, we, we couldn't, uh, not in any sort of meaningful, scalable way. Uh, but it became an incredible, incredibly powerful way to rally the community together. Um, and uh, just a little sort of you know, taste of what it is. Each of these frames basically represent a package of something that you can put into your games. And uh, there's 20,000 or so packages today. Uh, the top ones are selling such that the, the creators of th their creators are doing tens of thousands of pounds of income per month for themselves. Um, you know, and then there's a few hundred that, that have sort of significant, meaningful, livable or almost livable income, depending on where they live in the world. Um, and of course, that's you know, hundreds of people that are basically working for Unity and working for the community as a whole. Uh, so it's just an incredibly powerful tool to kind of bring these things together. So we made a lot of wonderful decisions, um, but we also had to scale, and it was very painful. And uh, you know, me, who had sort of gone from being a coder to a CEO, uh, you know, I had this um, this moment where I totally lost track. We went from 30 to 100 people in something like a year, 
um, a bit more actually, um, but um, it was just complete chaos. You know, um, suddenly when you have 30 people, you basically know what everyone is doing. You talk directly to them and so on. And so, so the, the, the sort of infrastructure fell apart and nobody was talking to each other. The only good thing about that time is that the engineers just kept coding and the customers kept buying. <laughs> so, so the wheels didn't quite fall off. But, uh, but it was an incredibly painful, painful thing. And, and so we went from this kind of do everything yourself, being all the customer meetings, being all the support calls, to the delegation phase, obviously, which is uh, well documented by now. But frankly, as amateurs, we didn't know. So we sort of had to learn it the very hard way. Um, so there's something about getting an assistant, having the exact team take over all, the, all, my, all my work, and, and actually kind of go to a zero, um, where, like, a, like a sort of a level zero where, where I had no responsibilities. And it was a magical transformation. We sort of, after me failing and flailing for half a year, we looked at each other, the founders, and we're like, this is really fucked up. Um, and, and you know, eventually, you know, we've, we kind of have to fire you um, or save you. And so we decided to save me, uh, which was very kind of them. <laughs> And it's actually, I was going to say it was an easy decision for me, but it wasn't actually. I was very tempted to, to stop. You know, as a major shareholder, not having to work is kind of a nice thing. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I also had a passion for the team and the company, and there were some wonderful people and the customers I, I had this deep passion for and still do. Um, so we decided to kind of do this. So, so overnight, it was fixed in like a matter of two weeks. It was quite, quite incredible. So basically, I went from having too much on my calendar to having nothing on my calendar. Everything was delegated. And then I could sort of discover and build from that. This magical time and, and, and taught me one thing, which is that you know, when people are failing in a company or organization, sometimes they're just screwed up, but sometimes they can be saved. Um, and if it's the right thing, you can, you can actually put the, you know, the, the, the effort into that. So, so later, we've actually implemented this as a whole program. We call it, it's a name from Microsoft called Performance Improvement Program, which in Microsoft is sort of a way to fire people, um, I've been told. Uh, like if you ever are close to a program like that, it's like you're dead. But uh, but in Unity, the the theory is like let's let's try to make a structure where it, where it's like 50-50 for survival, which is fighting odds and, and good enough to to let people really try, uh, and often works and has saved a lot of fantastic employees from kind of going the wrong way, uh, when they were in the wrong situation, the wrong environment, the wrong re reporting structure, the wrong task, traveling too much, whatever you know, all this stuff, uh, magical ma magical stuff when it happens and and uh, and kind of incredible how fast it happened. So that let us um, stumble into the, the sort of next stage of, of the company, uh, which I call the platform company, when we, when we, and, and the scaling company, when we had to go from sort of 100 to 400 people. Yeah, please. I love it. Yeah, so I think like, I actually, yeah, you know, I, I, that's a good question. Um, the first era is really long. <laughs> like from three to 30 people was freaking like eight years. <laughs> but most of it at the end. <laughs> As in like, you know, we just had a long time in the basement. Um, <laughs> is that funny? <laughs> of all the stupid things I'm saying. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Why was that funny? <laughs> no, actually, can somebody tell me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why did you still believe in yourself? So, you know, that's a really good question. It's mostly forgotten because we didn't sleep so much, we didn't eat so much. I think the brain has a way of flushing that out. Um, but I have, I have, I have, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, a source in the room. So I brought my mother, <laughs> who lives in London. I don't. Uh, do you remember what happened during these eight years, well, Mom? Well, well, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I think you always, you know, at every point in the stage, you had a vision of where you were going. Maybe it wasn't a good direction, it wasn't a good vision. <laughs> exactly where you were going. And then, you know, the next time I would ask you, no, it was something entirely different. But at any given point, there was some yeah. certainty. Sure. That's a, no, I think that's a fantastic insight about my, my psychology, uh, you know, which is like a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough phrase to say, but it's like a glass one-tenth full optimist. <laughs> you know, I think there's a bit of water in that glass. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a dog-headedness and it just like, we're fucking going to do it. 
Also, we took on debt, personal debt, <laughs> which you know I read somewhere has like created basically basically created Western civilization. <laughs> I think <laughs> some guy wrote that. So, so you understand how did you get the other people going? Uh, we were we were total partners. Mm -hmm. So okay. you know I said I was CEO and I was CEO. Um, but you know, we didn't take that very seriously. For, for us, that was just like, you know, yeah, you're the guy in the field, the CTO is the guy with the technology, and the chief creative officer is the guy who has the ideas, but also writes half the code. So I mean, that, that was the split, right? Um, so you know, I, never had a, I, never, I never overruled the other guys. I've never given them an order. Um, so, and we were, you know, actually not, in, initially I was like a lesser partner because I was sort of invited to join a two-person two uh, team. Uh, but eventually, after I don't know how many years, they looked at each other and they, they were like, "Wait a minute, David was here all along." <laughs> so let's let's split even. So we actually they gave me pretty much uh, even shares with them. Um, I had sort of resigned myself to the fate of owning you know much less than they <laughs> they did. Uh, it was very generous of them. They didn't have to do that, and of course that you know sort of reinvigorated my my willingness to to fight. I don't know. That's. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, please. So in, in that period, the, the first few years, was it all around passion? You three, you wanted to do that just out for fun? Or you had a vision about the commercial side and how not so much, not, much not so much commercial side. I mean, like, mainly because we didn't understand it. I mean, I'd started a few companies before, but tiny, tiny little weak, flimsy things, right? So. So for I mean, we knew there was money out there. Like we were not, you know, um, I mean, we knew that somehow we could probably pay our pay salaries to ourselves eventually. <laughs> but whenever we had enough cash flow to fund one employee, we did that rather than pay ourselves. So I, I think we knew that there was value, but we had no way of measuring it. In, in fact, you know, this mythical business plan I mentioned, you know, I don't think it had any numbers <laughs> because it was just a vague kind of feeling that there was something in this direction. Um, we did read sort of the tech bloggers, business bloggers at the time. That was kind of early, but there was a guy called Joel Spolsky who was like a god to us. He had been with Microsoft and fantastic blogger. He doesn't really blog anymore, but his early blogs from like early 2000s are unbelievable. Uh, stuff that is obvious if you've sort of been around business even a little bit. But for instance, like the, 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 po the, the essay or blog where he wrote about, you know, there's no price point in software between $1,000 and $100,000 because, you know, people can do you know, uh, sort of snap purchases of $1,000. Above that, it needs approval. And then you have to kind of bring in a dog and pony show and a trial and this and that. And that brings the next price point up to 100000 That kind of stuff you know, led us to pick the $1,000 um, and, uh, and so on. So we were thinking business all the time, but we didn't really have real experience in it. I don't know if that's sort of the question. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, eventually we, we figured out, I mean, we started to think about the, the industry I remember a, re a shocking realization. We had a, a lot of competitors along the way, and we can talk about that later or now maybe. But you know, along the way, we, we, we encountered a lot of comp competitors. And I remember like, there was this one particular French competitor that was, seemed pretty form formidable. They were like, definitely like, number one or two in the early days on our list. And then we realized that they had been acquired at some point without us really understanding what that was for 10 million euro, <laughs> it was sort of a shocking thing that you know, your big bad, badass competitor is worth uh, 10 million euros. Um, by that time, we were probably worth more. So we were sort of kept, kept, kept uh, pounding it. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was a strange, uh, strange path. Let's see. Oh, more questions? OK, uh, let's do that. And then I'll have to get back to my plan. So, I mean, like, we were ready. Like, that was the main thing. We had built the product long enough, so it was kind of good by that time. It had some love by developers. So we had been stupid enough to make a Mac-only product in the early days. Now, the game industry did not actually have any Macs. So that was, like, sometimes people called uh, the Mac the Unity dongle. <laughs> because if you wanted to use Unity, you needed to buy a Mac. Uh, no, no longer, but I mean, that was the case for many years. Now, it was so. You know what's luck and what's intuition, and we had a, a passion for Apple. We we loved their products, um, so I mean you could say it was luck that they made the iPhone, but there was also a strong intuition that we were attracted to this company and wanted to kind of hitch our fate to them. Um, 
than they did. And we had kind of a little bit of a brand. Um, actually, Scott Forstel, who was, used to be the Mac OS guy and then became the iOS guy before he was fired, um, he, he demoed Unity on stage at the Worldwide Developer Conference in 2005. So we had already, always had a little bit of a brand in the Apple world. So that helped, because suddenly there was a new gaming platform that basically had 100% overlap between owning a Mac and building for it, because you needed a Mac to build iOS games. Um, so yeah, it was sort of a, it's hard to know exactly what what, but you know, mix of luck and something else <coughs> is definitely what, what, what sort of brought us there. And, and the fact that had we started, and that's also, you know, a number of people try to start making a mobile engine at around that time. Um, but they were kind of too late because we were already kind of established, um, at least as something, right? Um, and that brings us to sort of these, you know, let's call it um, uh, three years, from 100 people to 400 people, uh, during which we enco encountered a lot, lot of um, street fights um, with competitors. And, and I, I sort of came to um, create a, a sort of typology of comp competitors. Uh, you know the four the four sort of uh, fundamental types. Uh, they're all very scary, and we've sort of met each and every one of them. <laughs> um, that informed the next stage, which I'll get to. So the first one is the toe-to-toe -to -toe competitor, right? It's the the guy who's basically doing the same as you are. They're better at something, worse at something. They're maybe just trying to be better at everything. Maybe they're not already. Maybe in some cases we had we had guys that were already there, and we sort of we had to be the toe-to-toe -to -toe, toe competitor. Um, and they're brutal and tough. Um, but that's rarely how battles are won, and, and in fact, we never. Our, our 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 path always had to be sort of to head away from them somehow. <laughs> there are cases where the, the direct comp competition, uh, you know, is, is fruitful, but uh, I think I think it's well established that that's something to avoid, um, and and those have never really been that that scary to us. Um, the second one is the um, the sort of seventy thirty uh, competitors. So seventy percent of the utility, thirty percent of the price. Um, you know, you make and, and by, by defining uh, the problem set as seventy percent of, of the feature set or whatever of, of, of another product, you can make it much cheaper. Uh, you know, the complexity of, of software products goes like this, right? So you add a feature, you need to, you know, you add ten percent features, you have to, you know, add thirty percent staff. It's it's pretty terrible actually, <laughs> uh, which is how which is how my, like Windows had I don't know how many thousands of developers and eventually ground to a halt and they couldn't bring that stuff out. So. So th those competitors are very scary. We used to be that guy. <laughs> like we came in very fast, you know, had much fewer features. We kind of sucked, but we just were good enough and cheap enough to get some adoption. Um, there's no sort of good answer to that, except if you are the leader, you just have to freaking grind it. <laughs> and, and you just have to be better. And, and, and you also have to force yourself to think about price. And we'll get to that. Um, th the next one uh, is the open source competitor. Uh, open source has incredible structural advantages. And it's just terrifying to compete with open source. Um, we're so lucky that, uh, that, that highly um, complex, tightly integrated, and QA, so quality assurance test heavy products, are almost never successful in open source. The only ex exception probably is um, in that scale is, is Linux, which you know, for, I mean, it such, forms such a sort of a you know, backbone for you know, trillions of dollars of market value. Um, that you know th they had a sort of the, a critical mass to, to be able to do that, so so that was never that scary to us, except that it's always a threat to your you know your cost structures, your margins, and all that. Um, the last one, um, which I've actually in our at least in our situation have found to be the mo the scariest, is the makes money somehow else competitor, uh, which is something that happens a lot in software. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's for instance. Um, in the strange path of ours, at some point we were competing with Intel, right? <laughs> so <laughs> what the fuck, <laughs> you know? So so Intel, Intel at the time we started competing with them had approximately 500 times more revenue and a thousand times more people, or the other way around, uh, and uh, and they had sort of sort of accidentally stumbled into owning a game engine business, uh, you know, every step of the way logical, the conclusion very strange. Um, and they, uh, and they, this business was actually kind of failing because they were losing to us. Um, so eventually, some wi wise person at Intel came up with like, why, the, why are we even charging for this shit? <laughs> you know, <laughs> if people don't want it for a price, maybe they want it for free. Uh, 
so they announced you know what they called project anarchy which is going to be like opposed to unity it was very clever pretty good marketing for such a big company that we really wasn't focused on it and um, i was absolutely terrified i mean it was so scary their stuff had some weaknesses but it was going to be free kind of basically open source and or la largely open source and had some amazing features um, that were better than our stuff in some cases and uh, you know I, I lost so much sleep over it and uh, the blow by blow of that is actually kind of complicated and we did a lot of weird stuff um, in the end though it didn't matter because their product sucked so they got out of the business a couple of weeks ago um, which was a nice relief I mean by that time we had already passed the scary phase but it was a good reminder that you know, you're going to continuously, if, if you're doing anything that's sort of remotely interesting, you're going to continuously get pounded on by people that are very clever and, and willing to, uh, to fight what, um, you know, I, I, I was describing it to somebody and I was like, it's like a nuclear chess, you know, you're, you're willing to sacrifice the whole board. You're willing to kind of, you know, all this stuff is dead just in order so we can conquer this part of the board. Bad metaphor is bad, you know, it doesn't map so well, but... But it's, it's, I, think, I think it describes very much kind of how, how software companies compete. Um, you know, not just on features, but on all these other weird stuff. Um, and, 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 and sort of seeing these continuous attackers and, and overcoming them all, but arguably kind of by luck. I mean, not really, well, I mean, there's, there's, fe there's factors that are in your control and factors that are outside of your control. So the quality of your stuff is sort of in your control. The quality of the other guy's stuff is absolutely not in your control. And if they're really clever, and if they continue doing it, and there's another one, and another one, and another one, I mean, like betting on always coming out ahead on that um, is sort of like betting on luck, which you know is not really a business plan. So, so, so this forced us w during this expansion phase from 100 to 400 people, where we learned to do China, Korea, Japan. It's very complicated. We went really native in these countries and did strange businesses, um, um, you know, working with schools in Korea and setting up a, kind of a, a research lab in China and all these strange things um, led us to, um, uh, and, and, you know, learning to sort of grow the global business. But all along, I was getting more and more paranoid and, 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 and sort of worried about the future. Um, and this forced us to what I call um, the... Um, the next stage, which is sort of the, the new business model phase, uh, which is arguably where we are now. So probably started happening around 400 people. Now we're 750. So it's been kind of a transition that we're still undergoing. And it's, it's very complicated. And we haven't kind of cracked all the nuts. Um, but it's, it's figuring out, you know, if these guys can make, be, make it free because, you know, somebody else pays the bills, because Intel, because that, because open source, because something, um, it would be very nice if we didn't have to worry about um, you know, competing on price. So, and, and, and it, in, in fact, this was proven entirely correct because, okay, step back. Um, so in, in, my, in my intense uh, paranoia, I was like, okay, we gotta, we gotta get into mobile ads. That's a big business, it's in infinitely scalable or seems to be, there's a lot of stuff there. Let's do that. So we hired a group of very smart people, uh, wonderful, wonderful people, um, and we put them to work. And they worked very hard. <laughs> and I looked at them after a month, after a few months, after half a year, after, I don't know, nine months. And I was like, fuck, this is not going to work. <laughs> so um, another painful, painful realization is, um, is the strange, sorry, it's getting complicated and stacked. Um, OK, so, so when, when you're. So every company has to go through a number of bottlenecks, right? Where, where you have to sort of figure something new out and do something hard and new. Um, so the first bottleneck of creating a company is a founding team. But we never notice because there is no such a thing as, as, as a good company without a good founding team. So it doesn't exist. OK, so that's the null, the null stage. Uh, the first, first one is then to build a product that somebody wants. Second stage is to get revenue and or venture capital or something else to pay the bills. Third stage, if that is successful, is to uh, get engineers to build, to keep building the product and make it better. All these are very tough bottlenecks that you know mo many companies do not succeed in. Um, the next one is to learn to build business infrastructure and sales and marketing and and the flywheel of that. Um, these things don't co always come in exactly that order, but it's very close. Um, and then, if that works, um, the next really really tough stage or like not to say bottleneck 
is, is, uh, is founders again. And, it, and, it, and it's, it's getting people in the company that have the sort of the, the, the style, the approach of a founder and, and the ability to think new things, build new products uh, and so on. Um, you know, sometimes it's called sustained innovation and yada yada, but I think of it as founders. And, and it turns out it's very hard to hire them um, and, and it's very hit or miss. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want to bad, bad, mouth any, bad mouth anyone, but, you know, of 750 people we've hired, or we've actually hired many more, uh, very, very, very few of them had that approach and style and, 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 and you know, ability. Uh, a few of them do, and they're amazing and, and very valuable. Um, some of them do in very sort of a particular way, so they're, like, insight, like they're visionaries of something kind of narrow, and they're also very important. Um, in this case, it was ads, and we were like, you know, this, these very smart guys are never going to get it done. So, so, so we went out um, and t t took the sort of the painful hit of acquiring a company. Um, acquiring companies is very hard. It's incredibly painful and stressful. And, uh, you know, I, I don't even really wish it on my enemies. Um, <laughs> were it not for the fact that it's also one of the most wonderful experiences in, 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 in life. Um, because a, a, a good acquisition is like, it's like, it's like uh, time travel. Okay? So, so one day you wake up and you're like, oh, fuck. I wish I'd started on this three years ago. I wish I'd founded my company with this person or that type of person. And, and, and through very hard work and months of grinding and negotiations and, you know, fancy wines to try to close and close and close, eventually you may be, may be signing a dotted line. And in that very moment, you travel back, you know, two, three, five, 10, 15, 20 years. And you build the company, you learn everything, you figure it out, and you arrive in the same point in time, and it's you. It's like, you know, it's like you've gobbled up something, you've become bigger, and it's, it's amazing. So we did that, uh, and we became an ads company, and we num made a number of other acquisitions, and it was very complicated, and the integration was hell. And, and you know, otherwise, you know, incredibly rational, wonderful people were at each other's throats uh, for no good reason, but they all became friends again, and it's wonderful, and, and, and so on. Um, and, and it creates a company that is that much more resistant, right? Like more revenue streams and, 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 and sort of new businesses that are very aligned, in our case, with having a big community of developers that are building wonderful things and we can help them make money. We can help them um, do all kinds of things around analytics, uh, understanding their users, uh, track their crashes on devices. It's a lot of, sort of finicky things that fit together into, into making a much kind of a broader company. So, now that brings us to today. Uh, a year ago, I, uh, we, we took uh, one of our board members, who's an amazing guy, and made him CEO. I moved back to Europe. I'm on the board. Uh, we've hired a lot of fancy people, and the company's doing very well. Uh, and you know, it's not a happy ever after story because nobody knows, and most companies fail and flatline, and that can still happen. Um, so, but it's you know, uh, the, the best antidote to that is a mixture of insane paranoia and a lot of ambition, and that's something that we sort of brought together uh, in the whole um, 13 to 15 year old history of this company. So <laughs> that's, that's the end of my sort of things that I really wanted to say. I've got a few others, but we can also take a question or two. Yeah, I was curious because I like your point early on when you said in the early days, you had a very big and open and vision, mm. uh, which made you have to be quite flexible. But how did you actually make decisions? What, did you use that vision as a reference point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, you, I mean, you're exactly, I mean, you already know this, but I mean, like, some, some wise person that I forgot the name of, um, probably several, said that the value of a, of a vision statement or mission statement can actually be measured in the quality of decisions that it helps you make. And, and, and I remember, like, you know, in sort of exec offsites and meetings, not every year, but maybe every two years, we got together and, and we're like, are we going to change that vision? Like, is that good to democratize game development? You know, it doesn't actually, does actually reflect what we're doing. Uh, I, I, I'm going to show you a video just to exemplify this, okay? So, so we focus on the game industry, and we, we love the game industry, and we have a lot of game developers and passionate gamers and yada yada inside the company. Um, but at some point we realized, actually very early on, that Unity would be useful elsewhere, right? And we've, we used to call it non-games, which <laughs> seemed a bit insular. So we, we ended up focusing on, we called it vertical, which is sort of strange. And we ended on cross-industry as a broad term to describe that. And I'll show you a real, uh, I'll cut it because we don't have too much time, but I'll show you a real of a couple of uh, seconds, minutes, whatever, showing sort of unity in these other areas. It's really cool, right? So bear with me.
it was like five more minutes of this, right? So, so, so this is wonderful. I mean, we love these use cases. It's so cool to see. Like these companies actually hire game developers or ex-game developers or people with the same skills to do these things, and they use them for all kinds of very important uses. Um, it doesn't fit with the original vision, right? So we were thinking about this, and we got close to saying, ah, maybe we're like, you know, democratize creation, <laughs> democratize interactive something. Uh, it's not necessarily bad. I mean, like you know, we got very close actually in, uh, to call to call that, um, and um, and then we were thinking about these industries, and and there's many of them, and they're very diverse and very complex, and they have deep sales cycles and and all kinds of stuff. And and we made a sort of decision um, that I that I mentioned uh, I wanted to focus on earlier, which is, you know, in the game industry, there's only two or maybe three things that matter. So it's like the production of games, it's the distribution of games, and arguably it's the playing of games, but that's more amorphous and not quite you know, commercial in the same way. Um, and we're really strong in the first, we're getting strong in the second, uh, because distribution is part of that is of course advertising, and, and, and playing, well, they're playing our games. So, so that means that we have very strong leverage, there's some really interesting, you know, we, we're in a very kind of, um, you know, hub, not spoke position. We have a lot of uh, leverage, we, we, all this stuff. In every single of these industries, we're not, right? I mean, in construction, it's like actual building. Then it's like selling the building. Then it's like something, then it's something. Then it's like marketing the building. Then it's maybe unity, right? Or in, 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 in the military um, industrial complex, it's like the production of munitions, threat of war, soldiers, training of soldiers, something, something, unity, right? <laughs> so so it, it's, it's good to be like number one or two, n one, two, and three in an industry. It sucks to be like number seven or eight. Um, so we actually decided not to leave this as in like we still want unity to be, to be an open platform. You can actually still use it like that. But we pretty much start, stopped marketing for it. We're not really putting a lot of effort into it. Um, and that was, I believe, the right, right decision. Um, but yeah, no, it's, but like you know, vision statements or whatever the heck, heck you call them uh, should of course be reevaluated continuously, and, and and we've done that. We just stuck with the original one, <laughs> which is a bit scary. But you know, we're not going to go there. <laughs> cool. You're gonna actually have a question. Of yeah. Um, so, speaking of essentially uh, the market leader being number one mm -hmm. and having Unity being the go-to tool for virtual reality developers everywhere. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about virtual reality going forward with Vive coming out this year and Oculus yeah. and Morpheus coming out next year? So I'm a completely converted believer. Um, so the first time I tried, I, I, I did not actually try VR in the 90s. I read about it. I was like a cyberpunk, sci-fi fan. I was very fascinated by that, but I never actually tried it, which is good because it apparently it sucked. Um, so much that you know the whole industry was burnt for. I heard it was a puke machine. Basically. It was a puke machine, and, and, and the, the, the industry was literally scarred for 20 years, and nobody would approach it again, right? So only this 19-year-old kid from somewhere, right. Hawaii, or I can't remember. Maybe uh, anyway, the wonderful 19-year-old kid, uh, Palmer Lucky. Um, he sort of was, you know, bricolaging some things and trying to figure it out and. and uh, and, and, and a very, very clever and fierce businessman, uh, Brendan Iribe, you know, joined him and they built this amazing thing called Oculus. And they brought like an early prototype to the Unity office in Copenhagen a few years ago, like just before the Kickstarter. So is that like mm -hmm. three or four years ago? Yeah, it was probably two and a half years ago. So. <laughs> I mean, the whole revolution has been so insanely fast. So they brought it to our office uh, just before the Kickstarter because they wanted our support. Initially, just morally, they wanted us to say we liked it and that we probably would support it. Um, and, and I put it on. And it sucked so much. Who is who isn't like who has not tried VR here? Okay, so I, it was it was really bad. So I put it on. I, I got a controller, and every like thirty seconds you had to press a button on the controller to level the ground because it sort of shifted, because like the accelerometers weren't calibrated. Um, but after like well, I just knew I I want to stay in there. I, I didn't actually want to leave. Um, and I've kept, ha kept having that experience. Like, it's just so wonderful. <laughs> it's so personal. It's so direct. It's so emotional. Um, it's overwhelming. And you know, for that reason, I actually wonder often about the use of VR in uh, industry or in business, just because you know, it's, it's overwhelming and almost spiritual. 
uh, like the, the stage, I mean, nausea is a problem and it's, it's going away. I think they can solve most of it. I don't know, is that 90% or 99.9%? .9%? We'll see. Um, but the stage before the nausea is like a tingling sensation, sensation um, which I think to some people will be felt as spiritual or religious. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'm not actually, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> And talk to God, I think, is the thing. But uh, no, so, so um, and, 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 and that, uh, so a friend of mine asked, so David, do you think you can make like a religion based on VR? <laughs> and my, my, my response, my, 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 my immediate response, the few times in life when I'm kind of clever is when I just respond to something without thinking about it. And it's like, I don't think you can make a religion without VR. Uh, so so I'm, a totally, I'm, I'm totally converted. However, the timing, the, the, the growth, the actual use cases, it's a crap shot. Nobody knows. Very clever people with very large amounts of money are behind it. So it's going to get pushed and pushed and pushed. Um, I mean, somebody also pushed and pushed and pushed 3D TVs, and they still suck, and nobody will ever actually kind of really use them as far as I can tell. Um, I think this will be different, but we'll sort of see. Um, AR is different. AR is like an overlay. It's glasses that just overlay some information. That's going to be all business, all uh, you know, industrial uses. Uh, I talked to the CEO of an industrial software company. They have like several thousand employees that build software to like manage mining fields and building sites and security things. And, and they love it. I mean, they, they, they think it's going to be a core part of kind of all these things. Um, so yeah. It's a, it's a crap job. We're investing a lot in it. I mean, Unity believes so much in it that we're going to not just be good, but like be um, sort of um, unrealistically great. I mean, we're putting like real sort of long-term R&D in place where we're going to take out patents and figure out how the future is actually going to work, which is kind of the first time we do that, by the way. Right. Um, so yeah, no, we're believers. Yeah. I mean, whether it's AR or VR, I feel like Unity would probably have a place in both. I mean, if we don't, then we've truly failed. <laughs> There was one before you, I think. Who was that? Maybe it was just you. Go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, can you talk more about the competition? They spoke about the 70 50 company and like the custom monetizing to other means. Like, how do you really counter it? And so, I mean, first, we were the 70 30 product, right? Eventually, uh, we, we sort of became so much a leader. I mean, not a, you know, we're not the leader in everything. You know, not at all. Um, we still have comp competitors and all this stuff. But you know, as, as we sort of at least had the momentum and the energy, the ability to hire very smart engineers at scale, and we had to sort of go from being a 70% product to 100% product, which is why when we went from you know 20 engineers to 300 engineers, <laughs> that's sort of the difference, arguably. Um, when we were countering companies like that. We were scared because we didn't necessarily have a really good strategy to do to counter it. I mean, um, we we there was a French company. Um, it's a long story, kind of weird, but uh, they ended up going back to the mountains of North Africa to 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 to, to, to survive for another day. It's like <laughs> it's like it's like the story of another organization. Um, but uh, but it it was a uh, it was. Um, in that case, they really st they fought very hard. They were very clever. They were like three programmers, just like we had been. But we had 20 and 50, and we just kind of you know, kept pulling ahead. Um, but that wasn't a given. And had that failed, we might have gone and tried to acquire them, which is, of course, a typical way of doing it if you're sort of a market leader and you have the ability to raise money and build kind of, you know, um, you know use, use sort of equity value in a, in a way that a small company doesn't. Um, but it's not a surefire method. I mean, they might realize that if we're worth this to these guys, let's just get some venture capital and move faster. Uh, we also considered uh, competitive hiring, but it's very hard when it's three founders or two founders uh, because you know, they, they are, have this sort of level of insanity that it makes them hard to hire. Um, no, I mean, there was no really good answer except it was a good reminder that we had to be fast. You know, software companies tend to go slower and slower. Um, so it forced us probably to revisit our processes even just down to QA, test, automation, um, build farms, that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, overall, it was probably beneficial to have these kind of competitors. But no, there's no sort of real surefire way of, of competing. Um, with the makes money in another way competitor, I mean, you probably want to be that person. Uh, I mean, you have to figure out a way to, to, to not be cornered 
by people that are willing to give stuff away that is as good or half as good or almost as good as your stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, no. I mean, we moved to the valley, or I did. So, so I mean, the story was that we, uh, you know, we were thirty employees uh, approximately. Uh, we decided to raise venture capital. Um, we met with a lot of VC firms. Uh, eventually, we were so uh, lucky and smart and whatever that we met uh, with the Sequoia Capital, which is sort of one of the best firms in the world. Um, and they got really excited. By that time, I had decided to move to San Francisco. I'd actually been talking about moving to San Francisco since 2007, and my friends were really tired of it. <laughs> uh, but I decided that to do it then, um, and they liked that. I, I, they probably wouldn't have invested had I not decided to move, but you know, it never became a point because I just decided it then. Uh, so I moved, and they invested, and uh, then I built up a team in San Francisco. Um, none of our competitors were based there. And yes, it was a massive disadvantage to them because we were learning that kind of Silicon Valley style playbook, the nuclear, the nuclear chess, uh, you know, the approach to going free and being aggressive like that, um, and seeing the possibility not to sell the company for 10 million euros as you know these French guys had did had done a different French group by the way um, years before, but actually you know if you've got some momentum, if you've got enough developers, apps, something. Maybe there's like a you know billion dollar unicorn, whatever you call it, in there, and and the faith that Silicon Valley has, um, sort of I don't know, invented almost, uh, and and that's now being spread. I mean, it's not only there, that that you can build companies like that was really strong to us, and and we were just playing, in the beginning we were playing the same game as everyone else, better software, cheaper, whatever. Eventually we were playing a very different game, um, and I think that's why partly why we. Uh, so far, we're able to outmaneuver some of the other guys. <laughs> yeah. I would like to know who are people that um, played key role in your support network becoming who you became into that position. What, what are the skills that you think made you successful in the end? Sure. Um, Well, I mean, yes. <laughs> I was brought up by a very nice, uh, very nice uh, parents, uh, who uh, you know, uh, you know, try to teach me to be sort of a you know nice and, and personable um, young boy, and and that did help. And, and sort of a you know a, I don't know a set of ethics or I don't know what you call it. Like you know just just a, a belief in, in being you know direct and honest and straightforward, um, which you know the venture capitalists. Are very very sensitive to, <laughs> so so they they absolutely will sniff out you know anything that's not you know straight up and and and, and sort of honest. So I mean that was probably one thing. Um, I mean what's wonderful is that there is this kind of unwritten code of entrepreneurs that you find it anywhere everywhere. I don't know why it's like that, uh, but you know it seems that every entrepreneur with any amount of success and many without um, has this deep um, I don't know believe or like. You know, they know they're required to help others. So you know, anywhere you go when you're building something, you get open doors and you get invitations to drink coffee. And you know, I learned from a lot of amazing people. Um, you know, one, 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 maybe the biggest sort of mentor of mine was uh, was uh, a uh, woman called Dan Green, who was the founder of VMware, the software company that is, I think, just got acquired by um, Dell uh, a couple of days ago, or will be acquired next year once regulatory, whatever. Uh, so she had built a company, actually several companies, but the last company she built, she built from like a founding team to 7,000 employees, I think, and uh, and was somebody who really kind of you know was willing to sit down with me and just kind of discuss with me and, and bear with my flailing and confusion during these tough times. Um, there's a bunch of others, but yeah, no, it's you know it's it's a very uh, welcoming and open world, and uh, I guess. I mean, the thing to learn is just to kind of let yourself be kind of caught by that, you know, and, and open to it. I don't know if that's a better, if there's a better answer. Yeah. Um, 
my co-founders. I mean, I learned a ton from them. We we're very different personality-wise. Um, we were actually similar skill-wise initially, but super different personality-wise. So we got pulled apart, uh, which mostly was a good thing. We sometimes didn't communicate very well or understand each other, but you know, we just definitely sort of were able to expand um, the, the sort of uh, you know the collective abilities of, of us. If that makes sense. We've got time for one more question. Maybe take it from this side. Yours? Well. This is too bad. Two questions. First, you. <laughs> and the, um, the way you nurtured the community, mm. has it changed uh, in the past few years? Past two years? Past few years. A few years, sorry, yeah. Um, the t community of developers. Yeah. It got worse. <laughs> Just because, you know, at scale, almost everything gets worse. Um, but it also got better. Like, we, we probably. Um, you know, hmm, how to say, so things grow in, in sort of, you know, in, in spurts and stutters and, 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 and things. So let me ask you another way. Okay. How, do you, how do you know if the, if the community is following you? Yeah, it's a very tough question because, uh, you know, they're very emotional. They're incredibly, inf uh, not, not because they're stupid, crazy people, but because they're <laughs> super uh, invested for better and worse in our success and, and, and support right if unity goes away thousands of companies literally are in trouble maybe tens of thousands uh, you know several hundred thousand careers are at risk or at least I mean they won't fail I mean they're smart people but you know can be set back right so there's a lot of people that are very reliant on us and, and then you know when these people see us doing things that are stupid or weird or incomprehensible they get very stressed and uh, you know, so to learn to um, communicate what we're doing, why we're doing things, and at least you know try to listen to them when they tell <coughs> us that we're idiots, is something that's always been very tough. And uh, we do it to some level, but it's always you can argue it's the whole in the whole history of the company that's just been like impossible to actually fulfill, if that makes sense. Um, you know, when you have a 1.1 million people using your software, and you got you know a few hundred people in the company. <laughs> Uh, it's just you cannot actually communicate with them w with the depth and quality that would be wonderful. So, but yeah, no, like, you know, between trying to have a very permeable barrier, so you, like a lot of the people in the, inside the company are exposed outside. We are distributed, like I mentioned before, which actually helps by being local. So like in not every city, but in 22 cities, there's local Unity people that are there to go to meetups and hang out with in bars and, you know, knock on the office off and, and complain too and so on so that that's actually been very beneficial um, I could go on for a while but yeah that's sort of you know <laughs> but it's an impossible like like everything else that you do when you're doing something challenging is like an impossible equation right because you don't have enough resources so you're gonna screw it up you're gonna do something really badly you're gonna fall behind and and you know I sometimes try to I, I would sometimes when when when, when, bring, when when even hiring people I would tell I would tell them listen like you know it's a startup it's high growth that means that it's flying very close to the envelope of what it can do. It's very close to breaking apart at any given time. And that means that systems are going to be bad. Things are going to be behind. You're not going to get your salary in time. I mean, you do that now, but in the old days you didn't. Uh, your computer is not going to work. Nobody is there to help your problems. Nobody is there to you know, tell you that you're OK. Um, so you have to have a certain robustness. And, uh, and, and the people that survived that, which is not everybody, um, came out much stronger, much more capable and, and, and also, you know, some of that is just the strength and willingness to engage with, for instance, people outside um, with a sort of strong back of knowing that they've, you know, that they're really um, uh, like partners to Unity, not just employees. And that really helps. So that's a convoluted version. One question. Got a question in the back. Oh, I think that was oh. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this general question you mentioned, you touched upon um, uh, how the game industry evolved in the last you know, decade or so. You mentioned when you started it was all triple A, big budgets. Now we have everything from Unity, mobile games, Steam. It's very, very diverse. It's wonderful. It's like it, it's the game industry has never been this good. It's been called the golden age for a couple of years. It's still messy. And, sorry, I'll let you get back to your question in a second. But it's, it's really a wonderful <coughs> industry in that you know, for many years it's, it seemed like a monoculture. Like then it was PC games, then it was MMOs, then it was console games, then it was Facebook games. Like if you're not, 
in I forgot the year 2007. If you're make, if you're not making a Facebook game, you're like basically lost. You cannot get capital. You cannot hire clever people. You're screwed up. A couple of years later, 2010, 11, it's like it's like mobile. If you're not in mobile, you're dead. And now it's kind of everything, which is awesome. But sorry, what's the question? I mean, it's a mess like every industry uh, that changes fast. You know, there's always people whose skills and capabilities are left behind. Um, maybe it's like in this in, in a lot of industries, but I don't know all the industries. In the game industry, there's a massive, rapid kind of consolidation and deconsolidation of companies. You know, uh, EA lays off, what was it? 3,000 people a few years ago and uh, you know, creates you know, 1,500 new little uh, mobile studios. That's a good thing for us. When they then get acquired into a few companies again, that's a bad thing for a company like us. I don't know if it's bad for the industry, but I think it probably kind of is. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful mess. Unfortunately, the time is really up. Uh, that's all the questions can really take. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David, and also Mrs. Uh, Helgeson. For <laughs> um, and uh, David will be sticking around for a couple of minutes afterwards at the uh, networking over drinks and uh, food right outside. Um, so if everybody can essentially uh, make their way over there right after this, that would be fantastic. And thank you so much for coming tonight.